Where were you born? Uh, in Oceanside, California, right outside of San Diego. A certain part of Oceanside you represent? Uh, no, no, no part in particular, just, you know, Oceanside and San Diego, 619 area. And how far is Oceanside from San Diego? Uh, around 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Right outside, it's a little beach town. And you still reside in Oceanside today? No, I'm actually currently residing in uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, right outside of Bureau Beach. And what age were you when you made that move? When I was 11. 11 years old? Yeah. Something out of your control? Uh, yeah, it was actually a circumstance with my grandparents. They were both uh, incapacitated and unable to take care of me anymore. So I ended up moving with my mom's sisters out here to Florida and, uh, or into Florida and um, ended up doing that and stayed there for like 10 years before I ended up going to Texas for a year and then back to Florida for the rest of my life. What happened in Texas? Uh, I was playing baseball for a year. So I was playing college baseball in Texas. And we'll get into that stuff a little bit later in this interview, but just curious how that worked out. Now, um, when you say grandparents are incapacitated, what does that mean exactly? Um, so just a little bit about my story, like a little bit about my background. My mom passed um, when I was quite young. She overdosed on heroin, and I never met my father. So my grandparents actually took care of me from a young age. And um, so when they you know, became incapacitated, I mean more along the lines of they both had strokes and just weren't able to take care of me to the, to the state deeming them able to take care of me. So the state found my aunts more fit to take care of me. I see. And uh, let's break a few of these elements down. Do you remember what age you were when mom passed away? Uh, when I was around eight or nine, probably. I don't like, like actually remember because it's something that like, I kind of wanted to block out of my life and try to fight you know, those memories. But mm. to be honest, it was when I was around uh, eight or nine. I see. And that's something you really want to get into here. Um, we can a little bit if you want to. It's not something that, like I particularly like, you know, want the interview to be like a somber, you know, sad story, you know. But uh, as far as her passing away, uh, like, did you actually see her pass? No, 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 no. Um, unfortunately, like, I have, you know, a couple of vivid memories with her, but the state did not deem her fit to actually take care of me day by day. Mm. So she was working her way to take care of me, back to, uh, back to be able to take care of me, and that's whenever she ended up relapsing and overdosed. I see. And... Um, when you were young, did you know she was? No, I did not. I did not know until, you know, I was a little bit older on, until I was probably in my teenage years is when I figured that, you know, some people had told me that she had abused drugs in the past and that she wasn't a bad person to not take that the wrong way and that, you know, things happen for a reason and to not, you know, look at my situation in a negative light. I see. And as you never met your father, but uh, in terms of your mom and, and, and biological father, um, did they separate? Uh, do, do you remember what age maybe they No, separated? I do not know. I'm not sure if, you know, if he was ever in the picture for her. I see. So, yeah. Never ever seen pictures of him? No. Have no clue what he looks not like? Not at all. I see. Uh, and when your grandparents take care of you, it's on your mom's side, I, I imagine. Oh, uh, yeah. It was my mom's uh, mom. And then uh, she was married to uh, my granddad. You know, I call him my granddad because he was married in, but he took care of me like a father, to be honest. I see. He was a father figure to me. Now, just curious, when your mom does pass, do you remember how you heard the news? Oh, yeah. Um, to be honest, man, uh, we were at church, or we, we were going to church. Uh, we went to church that Sunday, and I was bawling my eyes out, man. And then, you know, we had a ceremony for her where we ex ended up planting her ashes in a, in a plant so, or in a tree. That way we could, you know, spend time with her later on in life opposed from regular, you know, burials. I see. And do you remember how you received the actual news? Um, I was quite shaken up. Originally, like I was numb to it at first because I didn't really understand. But then about two days later, I remember just being completely shook up about it for like probably the remainder of that school year. I had gained a lot of weight. I had, you know, removed myself from my friends and it changed my life a lot for sure. Like, how do they tell you this news? Who tells you this news? I think it was something that was more like passed along the lines from my brother because I have a, a blood brother and he, he felt the need to, you know, tell me about our mom. And he always would kind of hint at stuff and tell me about things as, as we went got older when he felt I was, you know, old enough to handle that type of stuff. I see. So you do have one sibling. Uh, I have one sibling by blood and I have two siblings by adoption. 
I was, uh, when I was 13, I was adopted after my, uh, I came to Florida and I lived with my aunts, my mom's sisters for two years and um, they ended up getting sick. One of them had a seizure and one of them never really wanted to take care of me anyway. So then I was lucky enough to have a great family who adopted me and took care of me from the time I was 13 to the time I was 18 and made sure I went to school, made sure I played baseball, made sure I stayed up with my schoolwork and my grades to get a good you know, future in my life. So you do have one older brother. Yeah, I have one older blood brother. And uh, any idea where his whereabouts are today? Oh yeah, he's in Kentucky. He's got a kid now, and he's doing a lot better. And he, you know, he he straightened out his life the right way without a lot of help. That I, even some of the help that I got. I see. Now, uh, when you go to grandparents, when you go through uh, the the adoption situation, right. I mean the aunt and the adoption situation. Does the brother come along with you? Um, no, he didn't. He was a. Uh, separated from me around he was he's a lot older so he was separated when i was probably i like to say 11 and he was like in his 20s already so you know he was living his life Ah. you know maybe not in his 20s maybe in his late teens and he was living his life and trying to get his life started so you know he traveled a little bit but we've kept in contact and we did live together for quite some time in florida for like about about a year he came to florida so it was nice Mm. why didn't uh, it last longer than a year um, I think it was more like the situation he was in. He was trying to get back on his feet, and it was never more anything more than temporary. Now, with the adoption agents, uh, with the adoption situation, mm-hmm. uh, do they put you in a boys' home at first? Do they um, find this family? For when you I was first? when I was very young, I know my brother dealt with a lot of that, you know, foster home care stuff. Luckily, I was able to avoid that, and I was given a choice with all the uh, with all the times I dealt with the adopt- adoption agencies. I was given a choice on where I wanted to go and where they felt was the best for me, with me being the main person and the main focus in that equation. When you get with this adoptive family, uh, were you the first adopted? Yes, I was. I was. And um, they had two children of their own and, you know, they felt the need to show me through their family what a real family was. And what was that experience like for you, those years that you were with the adoptive family? Uh, I couldn't put a price on it, man. It was probably the best years of my life. What'd you learn from that experience? What'd you take away from that experience? Hindsight 2020. Um, You know, hindsight 2020, I guess I would say that um, just live it up while you can. If you have a family, take a, uh, take advantage of it. You know, don't take it for granted. It's it means more than life, man. L- family is everything, and and I, something that I always wanted from a young age. And when I got it, I I tried to live it to the fullest. Do you still keep tabs with the uh, the family that? Took yes, it? I do. And, and Mother's Day is coming up, so you know I'll have to give that give her a shout. My adopted mom. Now, um, when it comes to the. Uh, um, the adoptive situation, it sounds like your experience went really well compared to some other stories. Yeah, I would say uh, definitely, definitely compared to others. How come your story came out so well when there are stories and the adoptive family situation for some others isn't, is, is, is toxic? Um, I think it's more uh, along the lines of your own faith in yourself and that you will guide, guide through life knowing that you're, you're going to be different no matter what. And it's not you versus anybody. It's you trying to learn more and more from whatever God puts you in the situation. And if you know you weren't lucky enough to be blessed with a family that was as loving and caring as mine, maybe God was teaching you other lessons along the way. Now at 18, you do leave the adoptive family. Was right. that by choice? Were you forced out at um, 18? No, or? not necessarily forced out. I was playing college baseball. So, you know, I went to a school in, in Lake Wales, Florida for one year called Weber International University. And then I went to a school in Texas for one year trying to pursue my career and think I was going to make it big, major league type shit. <laughs> mm, I see. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little further in detail in, in a little bit. But uh, just curious, um, financially, Right? How did you grow up through all the different stages? Okay, oh so. man, I've I've lived it. I've lived in a lot of stages, man. I would say I probably have dealt with poverty and 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 eating ramen noodles without even cooking them, to five star and traveling the world with you know a family that loved me and wanted to take care of me. And I would say that there's something to be learned everywhere, and there's you know there's greatness and there's good in every situation, and you can't look at any situation like it's woe is me. I see. Now, um, 
just curious, uh, the way you grew up in the different environments, uh, did it lead you to seek making money early for yourself in life or? Um, yeah, as soon as I stopped playing baseball, I was pretty sure that, you know, a nine to five regular job wasn't what I wanted to do. So I started a business and, you know, I wasn't able to, to get the type of, you know, fulfillment from a nine to five or from school from, you know, that I was from my business and from music and from other, you know, avenues that I was taking up. I see. Uh, ever get involved in street activity when you were young? Oh God, no, man. Uh, I, I, uh, you know, Fort Pierce is a pretty street place, but I like to pride myself on the fact that, you know, the baseball field kept me away from the streets and any time that, you know, I did stay away from the streets would have been from sports. So I was lucky enough to stay away from that. Now, how young did baseball start for you? Uh, it started when I moved to Florida. I didn't start playing baseball until I was like 11 or 12. And, and just refresh my memory, was this around the... Uh, the, the ant situation. The ant situation. Yeah. Okay. Right. I see. And um, when it came to uh, school, what kind of kid were you in school? Um, I was smart, but I never really tried as hard as I should have. And I guess that was what my, my lesson to myself was with music was do the extra lap, do the extra push up, do the extra mile and, and always, you know, grade yourself tough, but give yourself credit too when it's due. Because, you know, with school, I didn't try my best. And I always was told by teachers that I could have done better. And I believed them, too, you know. Was this tough for you, um, different schools? Because you start with mom on the West Coast, then right. the grandparents in Florida, then the aunt situation, then the adoptive uh, family, different schools? Yeah, for you? It, yeah, it was definitely tough for me. Um, I would say the main thing that was tough was, you know, maintaining, like, a friend, a friend group. It was always fluid so with me you know I'd say I I had chances to to make friends and I, I kind of shied away from it sometimes because I knew that the situation was fluid and it could always change mm. a tough experience for you um yeah I'd say I'd say I was probably the the biggest thing is when I came to Florida I didn't really want to go I didn't want to leave California at all and my aunt, you know, she tricked me into thinking that I was going to come back because she knew I wouldn't agree to go without thinking I was going to go back. So she said, oh, you're going to be a month and, and you know, we're going to send you back to Florida or California. I said, all right. I counted down 28 days. I go knocking on the door 28 days later. <laughs> and she said, we're not going. I started to lie. I started to say, you lied. You lied to me. I was mad. But at the end of the day, I learned a big lesson that, you know, you can't always get what you want, but you're always going to get what you need. So. When it comes to changing schools, there might be somebody watching this that's changed a lot of schools. Now, I've seen television shows depicted and movies depicted. You know, sometimes when a kid, they're they're not growing up with their same group of friends right. and they're in different school environments. You know, we've seen some kids in these depictions where they're the bottom of the barrel. You know, right. they come in, they're the new kid, they're outcasted, they're lame, they're this, they're that. And then we've seen those 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 depictions where you know the kid rises through the ranks and becomes Mr. Popular. Will and, Smith, <laughs> right? You know, Fresh and, Prince and, of Bel Air, and really works his way up. Right, right. How did you find yourself with these different school changes? I would definitely say my role model was all throughout my life was Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Was you know if you're going to come from these situations and go to let's say you you go from a public school to a private school back to a private school back to a public school, no matter what, just always be yourself. Always, you know, try to make more friends and try to, you know, be outgoing and, and shit. Try to learn more languages. Try your, try your best. Always try your best. Give your hardest in school. It, it's worth it. It'll, it'll pay off for you in the end. You did both private and public? Uh, yeah, I've, I've attended both private and public schools. I say I like public a little bit more for the fun aspects of it, but private school was a little bit more tailored towards my needs and for, or for my future. Do you have children currently? No, I don't. If you did? Would you want them in public or private? I would put them in private school, without a doubt. Now, when it came to school, uh, I asked you what kind of kid you were in class. Uh, you wouldn't say you were an athletic? You wouldn't depict yourself as an athletic, an athlete, a jock? A, no, a, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a jock. I didn't really, you know, mingle with them, them kids too much, but... At the end of the day, you know, being a sports fanatic, it was part of my life so much that I guess there was the humor that comes along with that and the, the picking on people and the teasing and stuff. But at the end of the day, man, I was just trying to be myself always. And mm -hmm. I knew music was going to be something that I wanted to get into from a young, young age. How young did that start? 
Uh, when I was, when I saw Eight Mile, I knew I wanted to rap. I knew I wanted to rap immediately. Eminem. But Eminem was my. I knew I was like as soon as I saw Eminem, I was like I I know I can you know tell a story similar to him. I've been through things that he's been through, or maybe you know my perspective could shine a different light. Um, I didn't actually pick it up and start rapping, rapping until I was like 19, and then I didn't actually make a real song until I was like 21 and like recorded it and like put it out, released it, and for people to hear. So it took a long, it took a long time and it took determination and it took a lot of haters. <laughs> and we'll get into all that. Uh, I do want to ask you this: You did mention like teasing and stuff like that. Were you bullying others? At no, I would say like uh, with like a, the, the atmosphere of like uh, being sports, you know. It's a competition, and from when I was raised, you know, if you ain't first, you're last. I see. Uh, were you part of a certain clique or crowd when, when you were in school? Um, not necessarily. Like I say, I was switching schools so much, it was tough. I had a, like, when I was like 12 or 13, I, I had like two or three friends. Like, one of them ended up becoming my adopted brother that was like just tight knit, and you know, we couldn't be, we were inseparable. But other than that, like, I didn't go mingle too many friend groups. Mm. How big was gang activity back then in uh in Fort Pierce? Yeah. Um Fort Pierce is it's got some some real real bad gang activity and like just north where uh where Melly's from is Gifford and that's got some real bad gang activity also. So to be honest, man, uh if you it, Vero Beach is like the main beach town. It's like it's little it's 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 hidden. They don't want you to know about it. And then you got Fort Pierce, you got Gifford that it's got all these people that's just crying and fighting and trying to, you know, make it out of there or, you know, trying to make the best life for themselves. And sometimes it ends up being, you know, like you were saying, gang activity because these people, they group together to try to get the best advantages for themselves. And you can't really blame them because at the end of the day, um, the mentality and the lifestyle that they're living is been like that. It's been grandfathered in. So it's, they don't look at it as a bad thing. Uh did you ever join one back then? No, God, no. Why not? Because you had the uh, the uh, the family structure there. Yeah, with the I had the family structure and the baseball and 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 before music was ever a thing, I you know I thought that that lifestyle was quote unquote cool, but I didn't think that you know it was something for me. I always thought that that was something that like was something that was on TV, I guess. And then when I saw it more in my real life when I came to Fort Pierce, opposed from being in California. I was like, wow, like just seeing this is, is, is something, you know, but it's not something I wanted to live day by day, really. I see. Just curious. Now, uh, when it came to music, did you ever do music class in school? Nah, I mean, like, obviously, like you have to take a few music classes, but I, like I was telling you, I never took music as serious, I mean, I never took school as serious as I probably should have. There was one music teacher I particularly liked, but it wasn't because of anything to do with his style or anything. He just played music that I really liked. Like he would play the Beatles, he would play the Mamas and the Papas, like he would play old hippie rock that I thought was pretty cool for like a musical class. But never did the band, never did chorus. Nah, I never did band. My adopted mom would have loved that. <laughs> she would have wanted to meet too, cause she was in the band, but it was just wasn't my forte. Were you ever freestyling or battle rapping others? Oh yeah. When you were in school? Oh yeah, coming up, um, I, w I would always be the white kid that rapped. Like I was always be the white boy that was like part of the group that was, you know, the rapper kids. But I never like was attached to that group, but I always knew those kids to make sure that they heard me rap and they knew I was rapping and they knew it like Kevin's doing his thing, you know? But um, I, I guess like in high school, we had a couple legendary battles at parties and stuff, but it was mostly over like, you know, People that, you know, we knew each other for a long, long time. We was good friends. It was never nothing like anything serious or drama or nothing like that. Were you good at any of this stuff back then? Um, I, always, I would like to think I was, but you never know, man. I, I think uh, I had a lot, I had a lot of, I was popular. I was very popular, you know, in high school coming up. So I guess that kind of like tailored me to think, oh, you know, you can do this. You're going to be somebody. And that had gave me the confidence. But actual skill, I did not develop that actual skill until a lot later on. I see. Ever participated in talent shows back then? Yeah, I did, actually. Um, I had a, well, this wasn't a, a talent show. It's like a Christmas recital. I had a Christmas rap one time that I rapped about King Wenceslas the King <laughs> or King Wenceslas or something. It was funny, man. 
but never did like a talent show where you placed like first, second, third. No, I year. never, I never did that, man. You did do baseball. Did you play any other sports aside from baseball? Um, coming up, I played football. And then I played football all the way up until, you know, high school started. And then I knew baseball was what I wanted to take serious. I took baseball pretty serious. And what position did you play? I was a pitcher and a first baseman. And what jersey number? Uh, 23, Michael Jordan, baby. And that was the reasoning behind that number? Oh, yeah. And you obviously did varsity. Varsity. Make it to state, make it to nationals? Yeah, we won states a couple times. Or we won states one year and we lost one year. Um... We went to South Carolina and won a regional tournament one year. And then, uh, man, to be honest, we, I don't think we ever got the, the, the nationals, man. But you were good enough for an athletic scholarship. Yeah, I was. And, and that was a blessing. That was a blessing in its own right. And you ended up going to two different schools? Yeah, I went to one school that was a four-year university, which is only an NAIA. So I felt like I was kind of like sheltered in and I was going to end up staying there for my four years. So I ended up switching to a junior college, which is only a two year to give myself more opportunity to possibly switch out and then go to division one or maybe get drafted if I was lucky enough. And what happened? Why couldn't you D1 it? Um, I was, went from throwing around mid eighties, which is uh, anyone's familiar with baseball, which is like decent for college. And I ended up throwing 77, which was the velocity I was throwing when I was 12. Oh. So I was like crying my eyes out and I was all sad and I just knew it wasn't gonna happen anymore, you know? I see. All right. Uh, did you make the right decision, though, going from the four-year program to the two-year program? Uh, probably not, but I met a lot of cool people, and I met, you know, I, I learned a lot of lessons that taught, like, Texas taught me a lot that I couldn't have ever learned here or in, I mean, in Florida or in uh, California. It was, it was Texas born and bred. Did you end up completing that two-year program? Um, yeah, I did. I completed my degree with, with that two-year school. And then I ended up trying to continue on and get my four-year degree, but I never finished it. And Why I would not? like to one day. Um, I, I feel like I, I ran into, you know, the business that I started and the music deal and, and, and getting my, my actual life get going. And I just, you know, I never really followed through with it and finished it. But you did at least get the associate's degree. Yeah, I have an associate's. And, uh, uh, I guess there's no major tied to that because it's just the you first can two get years. a major. You can get a major. You can get associates of science or associates oh, okay. of yeah. Did, did did you? Is it an associate? Yeah, it's assignment? an associates of science. Okay, got you. Now, uh, before I go a little bit deeper with the college stuff, I do want to ask you this: uh, when it came to you graduating high school, obviously they give these senior superlatives out. They're okay, awards yeah. In the yearbook, like most likely to succeed. Biggest flirt, best dress, things like right. that. Did you ever pick one up? Yeah, I think mine was uh, most flirty. <laughs> Are you, you still think you're living up to that or no? Yeah, I can be a flirt. Don't leave your girlfriend around me. <laughs> now, okay, I do want to get into the college stuff here a little bit. Uh, did you name the schools in this interview? Yeah, I did. Vernon College was a school in Texas and Weber International was a school in Lake Wales. You did. Now, uh, I did ask you... Um, you know, if you if you made the right decision four to two and, you know, thinking maybe D1 options, but hindsight 2020, if you could redo those choices again, what would you have done any different if so? Uh, I probably wouldn't do anything different because I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Okay. Just curious. Do you have a, I mean, obviously, I guess circumstances are different for everybody, but is there anything you would say maybe to somebody that's in a similar predicament and, you know, with the with the, with the, I forgot what you call it, the NI, NAIA. NAIA situation. Yeah, I would the, say the biggest advice I have for anybody going through that uh, situation would be to, you know, adv ask for advice from their coaches, ask for advice from their parents, because I was far removed from that. I had, you know, my head screwed on to where I knew best, and I knew, it, and hindsight 2020, I think that those people knew me enough to give me a better advice in the situation. I see. Uh, when it came to the, the school stuff, um, did you choose the right schools though? Um, Were you getting offers from other schools? Yeah, I had one school in Oklahoma that offered me and I went out and visited that school. It just wasn't for me. It was a, a little bit too quick of a switch originally to go out there and leave and I didn't want to go, go out first. And I ended up staying at the school in Weber or the school in Lake Wales in Florida. And then I went to the school in Texas the next year after that. I see. 
Now, these schools do have reputations, I imagine. Every school has a reputation. Yeah, of course. Uh, how did these, I don't know what these schools' reputations were, but did they hold up to their reputations or? Um, not really. Like, to be honest, like the school, that, that the, what they sold me on wasn't really what it was. Not to say that the athletics wasn't great and the, and the school wasn't great, but it just, you know, I guess my whole idea of college was going to be something that really it was different. Uh, did you ever join a, uh, a fraternity or anything? Of that no, nature? I didn't. No frat boy shit. Why not? Just curious. Um, I guess I just heard a lot of bad, you know, connotations surrounding it, and it kind of made me feel as though that wasn't something that I wanted to be a part of. And the athletic scholarship uh, held you, uh, was good for the whole ride? Yeah, it was good for my first year. My first year was the, the school in, in Florida. I had this athletic scholarship, and then I ended up walking on at the school in Texas. So you end up having to pay out of pocket for anything? Um, no, I, I was able. To, uh, I was lucky enough to have a Florida prepaid plan that paid for the majority of the. Ath I mean, the actual classes, and then you know I walked on. So that's what it was with the athletics. Uh, it kind of it covered the books right, and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. So you know I was lucky enough to because that school was a lot cheaper than the first school I went to. I see. Being that it was a junior college. And. Um, When it came to the music side of things, I remember you said there was an age where you said you had a song and you were promoting it and you started taking Around stuff Around 21. Years. And you said this was after college was done for you, the college experience? Yeah, after college like was, was getting wrapped up. Um, actually, my second semester when I had hurt my arm is when I started writing music. And I started writing music every day and I, and I noticed that you know, I had taken a proclivity to her, towards it and, and there was this gospel singer that was you know, my roommate. And I would always tell him like, man, I, I swear my songs are good, I promise. And you know, sure enough, he actually liked a couple of them and he would sing them. And those songs ended up being a couple of the songs that I released later on as my own, which is a rap version or a little bit twisted here and there. So did people know you rapped when you were Oh, in for college? sure. Mostly everybody I knew told me that I should rap and continue to take it seriously. Did you feel like you gained any sort of fan base when you were in college with your music or no? No, not because I didn't have my head screwed on straight tight enough to realize that I should have been doing it then. And, and, and when I got a little bit older is when I realized, you know, that was a great opportunity for me. So I guess that would be my advice for anyone else is to use schools while you're in school to, you know, further yourself any way you have. If it's not education, then use to get your music out there and stay in school to do music. So you get this, this degree under your belt, the AA. Then after that, uh, the song the song is... Yeah, the song, it was probably like a, a, a three months transition okay. of just, you know, here's, um, this is what I'm doing now. And, and then I started the business, which was SOS Publications, which was, you know, me managing artists, me promoting artists, me building websites to, to, for artists to get their music out there. And, you know, not necessarily focusing on myself, but also with the, you know, with the wherewithal to know these people one day could help you if, you know, you do enough for them. That was I what see. my mentality was. And, 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 and why do that so early? Why not just concentrate on you the whole time? I guess for two reasons. One, my image wasn't really ready. Um, I had went through, when I stopped playing baseball, I guess I had just went through a lot of de like depression where I was like, you know, I gained weight and I wasn't ready to push myself in that way. Um, the same way I was willing to push somebody else, I guess, which is, you know, contradicting. But... Um, and secondly, I would say the, uh, the second reason would be um, more so. What was the question again? I'm sorry, man. I was asking why not focus on yourself as an artist? Okay, yeah. Why kind of start shifting? Deviate, toward, yeah. yeah. So I, like I said, the first reason would be because, you know, my image and my weight, I had just went through that, all the depression and, and gained a bunch of weight. So I wasn't willing to push myself the same way I was willing to push somebody else. But secondly, I would say it was more because I, I know good music. My ear for music is, is number one for me. My ear is, is more so than my writing talent for my rapping talent. My ear for music and knowing what a good beat is for what a good, for what a good project is, I could, tell you, I could tell you that first, and that was one of my talents. So I knew my own music was not ready to push to the, the masses and tell all these people, you know, lights, camera, action when it's not even rolling yet. Mm. With the depression side of things, was that something you were 
officially diagnosed of or oh no I, I would say i'm more self-diagnosed it because i look back on how happy i am now with like i love life every second you know i love every second that i live life and i look back on life then and i was definitely hollow and i was seeing a different perspective of life what caused the depression back then i think it was more so the baseball being over and you know realizing um around my 19th birthday i just had like a, a, a not epiphany but in a bad way i had more like a I felt like I was very alone, even though I had the adopted family and I had all that. I just felt like it was always going to be me versus everybody instead of like accepting the world and then the world would accept me, is which I've been trying to do lately. I see. And how did you end up coping with the uh, self-diagnosis of depression back then? Um, copious ways, I guess. I wouldn't, you know, really like to get into too much, but I guess, you know, everyone has their own way of self-medicating, if that's the best way of of answering that. Mm. So I'd assume some sort of drug use. Yeah, just smoking weed, man, to be honest. I'll, you know, smoke a bunch of weed and maybe go out and drink too much to excess. I, I don't drink, I drink occasionally now. I, and if I do drink, I try to drink two or one or two beers and call it a night. And just curious, because of the life that you, um, you've you experienced with a multitude of different things in your youth. Right. Um, and the different financial classes and just a lot of stuff. Uh, did you ever get counseling for this stuff? Did you ever get therapy for this stuff? That's actually a great question. Um, the therapy that I was supposed to have when I was younger, I guess I shied away from because I saw what it was doing to my brother. And it was kind of like putting him in these positions where he didn't want to bring up these memories or speak with these people that he didn't really know and didn't know if they cared for him or trust, and he didn't trust in them. So I would always shy away from that from a young age. And by the time I had gotten to like, you know, move to Florida, the people, the counselors that did try to talk to me had no idea who I really was because I'm a completely new person that's not from any, you know, from California or anything. So it was definitely um, a shocking experience for me because I discounted how important a counselor could be, a therapist could be, and, and you know, someone that could actually understand the, the chemical going on in your brain. Um, I still haven't gone and seen counseling though, to be honest. Did you feel like you needed it back then? Do you feel like you need it now, perhaps? Um, I would say I'm more leaning towards it one day. Um, I would never say back then I needed it. I was completely against it, like I say, for what I saw it do to my brother. Did, but do you wish you would have done it back then or no? No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my decision to do how I, to leave it how I had it. Just curious. And uh, I also want to ask you this, when it comes to uh, jobs, did you ever try your hand at a job before yeah. the, you know, the, the SOS business? Yeah, SOS publications. Yeah. Before that took place, was there ever a hand at a job? Yeah. Um, what did that resume look like? The first job I ever had was delivering pizzas. The next job I ever had was at a car wash. And the current job that I have besides my business is a land surveyor. And the pizza dealer, was it a, a commercial a pizza? No, nah, I was just a mom and pop and my best friend was a manager and, and he would give me all the good deliveries. <laughs> Was that ever dangerous, a dangerous job? Oh, hell yeah, man. Delivering pizzas in Fort Pierce was definitely a dangerous endeavor. And uh, just curious, uh, with any of these jobs that you named, were any of them tough? Um, I'd say the toughest one out of all of them would be uh, probably land surveying. is is tough in, in a good way. You know, it, it, it puts you, to, it learn, teaches you some hard work and getting out there and, and, and really learning how to, how to, the real trade of things and, and, and home building and stuff. How did you land into that or fall into that? Um, a good buddy of mine was a, uh, who I grew up with, who knew me forever. I had did a lot of a lot of favors for him, and you know, like put in work for him when I was younger. And he had he had had that job, and then he went back to school, and he was like, "Oh, I'm gonna put in a good word for you, put in your resume." And I ended up meeting some people that you know really helped me out a lot. Any crazy stories dealing with any of these jobs that you named? Oh uh, man, the car wash man, I can tell you. Always keep your change. Do not put your change at a car wash. People be stealing change at car washes, man. But um, other than that, fights at the car wash. Uh, the craziest story at the pizza delivery place was I went to deliver a pizza and the guy tried to tip me by showing me his wife's tits. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, 
how how good did they look or how bad did they look? Man, I, I, I told them I need some money, man. I don't need to see all that. I need some money. I'm a kid. I'm struggling out here. Did he eventually give you some money or no? Yeah, he ended up caving and giving me some money because he knew uh, he knew my, my manager pretty well. Oh. So he, he like grabs his wife and is like, I can do this for you? Or is nah, this nah, something nah. he says? His, his, wife was on the, his wife was on the couch and he answered the door and, and he goes, you know, I don't got a tip, man, but, you know, I'm going to let you see my wife's tits. And I looked at him and he's being for real. I'm like, oh, shit, he's actually being for real. Like, this dude really is going to let me see his wife's tits. I'm like, oh, man, I need some money, man. I need some, I need some dollars. Now, did you end up quitting these jobs or getting fired from them? Uh, I quit. I quit the... The pizza delivery job, because, you know, I went to college, so it was like, I'm going to college now. And then um, the car wash, I quit that job, but I left on good terms because I had got this new job. So I was like, man, you know, with the business and, and doing the SOS publications, there's just no you know way I see myself staying in the car wash for anything other than just paying my bills, man. Just getting money to eat. And just curious, you seen other people steal change, or did you ever grab at some change? Oh man, I would never, I would never do that. But I definitely saw a, more than a few could take their hand at some change, man. Uh, did you ever try to stop anyone from doing it? Um, I would, I would be lying if I didn't say I did. But at the end of the day, that's just my conscience, you know, the, the little cricket on your shoulder, shoulder telling you the right thing to do. Uh, when you said fights, you ever got into a fight at the car wash? Oh you hell said- yeah, hell yeah, people, man. The car wash was nuts. That's I think it was a combination of the 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 situation you're in, the heat all day, and the 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 people that they hire were always felons or people that you know can't get hired other places. So they see me, they'd be like, "Oh, it's a white boy, blah 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 blah." You know, they try to make me do all the work, and I'll be like, "Man, listen, <laughs> I've been here at this car wash. This is my car wash." So I put people through the ringer if I had to. So you're fighting employees, not customers. Oh God, yeah, no, never customers. Customers is always the, the the customers always right. And you were defending yourself in these fights. Most of the time, yeah, most of the time, or defending other people, you know, that wasn't really, you know, deserving to be picked on or bullied and stuff. So, so we're talking physical fights. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there was physical fights at the car wash probably once a week. That was probably the most vi- like physical job that I ever worked at. Had you learn how to fight? Um, my older brother, man, my older brother, when I was a young age, just instilled like whooping my ass on a daily basis, like right after cartoons in the morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, that was his go to hobby <laughs> was whoop my ass. Were you good at it? Um, I hold my own, man. I fight to the death. That's my mentality is I'm not fighting to fight, man. If somebody really wants to fight you, you know, it is what it is. And you're going to have to earn your respect for your life somebody trying to take your life, then you meet them with that type of force. I'm not the type of person to promote violence, though. You know what I mean? When it comes to the food, like the pizza spot, are you sick of pizza because you... Oh, hell yeah, man. I can't stand pizza now. I cannot stand pizza now. If you could, would you ever consider owning a pizza delivery service or a car wash yourself? Uh, More along the lines of a car wash, probably because it would be a lot more easy to operate. A lot more, yeah, a lot easier to operate. Just curious there. When it comes to your family, um, okay, uh, the grandparents, they passed away? Yeah. Uh, the aunt situation, did they pass away too? No, they're not passed away, but they, they my aunt had got sick. She had, um, had epilepsy. She had a seizure while we were driving, and that's why the, the state didn't deem her she was still, you know, with, had her wits about her, but the state, the state didn't deem her able to take care of me in the full ability anymore. Did, did that seizure lead to a car accident? Um, my other aunt ended up driving or grabbing the wheel and, and steering us clear of, clear of any accident. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was nuts. Uh, are you on good terms with these aunts or, or no? Um, I'd rather not talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the adoptive parents you're still uh, in good terms with? Yeah, I'm in good. I'm in good terms with them. I'm in good contact with them. You know, probably as much as anyone else is with their parents. And when it comes to your sibling, I know you had two adoptive, uh, quote unquote, siblings. But right, uh, your 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 biological sibling, did he do music himself too, or no? Just no, you? he didn't ever actually do music. Um, but he supports my decision to do music. He actually likes it a lot. And, and I have a song that's about our mom, and he likes that song the most out of all my songs. 
You were the youngest between you two. Yes, sir. What's that like being the youngest of the family? I liked it. I felt like I had a lot of attention on me and I've always liked that. I've always liked the attention on me. Anything you would say to somebody that's the youngest in their family watching this? Don't be a brat. And uh, what does your adoptive family think about your music career at this point? Um, that's a good question. My my mom, she uh, she she supports it. That my my adopted dad didn't necessarily support it at first because he's more of a business oriented guy, and he you know wanted to see the ins and ins and outs. Um, my mom always trusted in my decision making and my ability to know what's right and what's wrong. So she trusted in me, and she would always tell people that would ask about me that Kevin knows what he's doing and that he'll be all right. So I love her for that. Was she supportive right away or did she have to warm up to it? She was supportive right away. What do they actually think about the music though? Uh, I don't think my mom particularly likes the rap aspect of you know my music, but she supports anything I do and she's more understanding of the times now, you know? So she understands that that's what people, that's the music that people like, so. What about the cussing? Uh, I try to keep it to a minimum if I can. You know, I have a few songs where I cuss a lot and 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 do too much, but I try not to show those songs. <laughs> Has uh, either of them seen had a chance to see you perform live yet? Uh, no, they haven't, and and I would love for them to one day. When it comes to advice, best advice your adoptive parents have uh, ever given you at this point. Best advice my adopted dad ever gave me was, don't take God off the shelf only when you need him. You have to have a day-by-day -day relationship with God. Are you following that? Yeah, for sure.